Robert Nassif. Let me start out by saying I was not a young father. My son, my son Tariq, is 37 years old. Please don't do any quick math. <laughs> What I've learned from him, I'm going to try to put into words about autism and what it means to be human. Like most children with autism, he was seemingly normal at birth. He was meeting all of his developmental milestones. Here he is making eye contact at one day old. What could be more normal? And those of you who are parents, you remember the first time you held your child. And everybody else also, just the magic of holding a newborn. It just opens your heart to the miracle of new life. He wasn't the son I expected. He wasn't the son I dreamed for. My hope that he, he would be proud of the man and the father I became in the process of raising him. It wasn't easy, it was a long journey. I'm gonna give you a short version of it and a longer version of the lessons of the universality of this experience of being different, of having a different kind of family with a different kind of child. Wow, it's just kind of that awesome moment. Now, he walked on time, right on his birthday, that was pretty cool. Then he started talking. Then at 18 months, he stopped talking. Time stopped in that moment. Time really stopped. The train ran off the tracks. And ever since that day, I've been slowly and then sometimes more quickly living and learning about autism, about what it means, about what it is for a given individual. I've been reading about it, writing about it, talking about it, counseling families, children, and professionals, teaching about it. Um, and I never dreamed what my son, without any words, could open and teach me. Here's how it goes. The incidence of autism was five in 10,000 in the mid 80s when he was diagnosed. Today, it's one in 68, close to 2%. If this was an average group here, there'd be two people with autism. And maybe there is, we'll see soon. Um, maybe not, but, but we're, we're talking like almost 2% of every birth in the industrialized world, which is all we can measure, turns out to have autism. So, um, he never spoke again. He never learned to read or write. So, but, slide missing. All right, we're going to go on. So, so today, I was going to show you a slide of him right now with me, but today, um, I'd have to say, you know, he lives in a group home outside Philadelphia. He is happy most of the time and severely autistic all of the time. So, so that's the Reader's Digest version. Now I want to ask you a few questions. How many here are family members of somebody with autism? Could you just raise your hands? Okay. And, and that by that, just, just in case, um, parents, grandparents, cousins, siblings, aunts, uncles. Okay, all right, we got quite a few. And how many have some kind of personal or professional connection to someone with autism? Wow, wow, this is great, this is great. And some of you have both, 
You're like me, a double agent, a foot in each world, you know? And that's a pretty cool place to be. All right. Now, here's a little more how that journey goes on the inside. On the inside. It's a transformational experience. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. There he is now. Always happy, always autistic, <laughs> and, and quite handsome, and looking right at the camera, okay? A myth that there's no eye contact, there's a different kind of eye contact, but a myth that there's none. Okay, so here's some important things. This spectrum of autism from the mentally gifted to the severely cognitively disabled and nonverbal has a lot to teach us about our shared humanity. But getting there, both for the individuals with autism and for their family members, is a transformational experience. It changes us at the core. It takes more out of you than you knew you had and stuff you didn't know you had. So before I go on, does anybody here have autism and is comfortable to disclose? Okay. Then presumably, the rest of us, or all of us, have been diagnosed normal. Like, who did it for you? Your parents? Someone else? <laughs> so, so, this condition of being human comes with it with a certain amount of uniqueness. And this transformation... Oh, they're out of order. Okay, sorry about that. This transformation is a process. So, let me talk to you about it. I'm the grandchild of immigrants, Arabic and Italian. Many of you are, most, probably most of you are, you know, descended from immigrants or you are immigrants. And, and we have been taught, like me, and conditioned, that we can work hard and do anything. It's the American dream, right? It's the American dream, but it wasn't true this time. It wasn't true. And that was a rude awakening. So, so one night, um, I'm writing in my journal, I think my son's about eight at the time, and I'm kind of weepy, and, and I realized that I'd been trying so hard to change and fix him, but that he had changed me. That I had become, and I was becoming, a different kind of man, a different kind of father, than I ever dreamed of. And that was the beginning of my road to acceptance and awareness, and ultimately appreciation of the difference that autism brings to the table. But just like the butterfly in that cocoon, it took everything I had. There was a grief like no other. It felt like a death, but it wasn't. And that felt horrible. So you grieve, you moan, you complain, you scream, you cry. And how long does it take this Morning for the perfect child, this morning of the death of a dream, it just takes as long as it takes. And that varies. But eventually we come through it. We come through it because we love our child as much as life itself. And it was, but it was so hard to comprehend that a little boy so cute, so handsome, so perfect, could have a condition so invisible so life-defining, that wasn't easy to wrap my head around. 
I couldn't get the A word out of my mouth for a long time. But when I was writing in my journal that night, something loosened up. And I could say, he has autism to myself and I'm okay. I can go on now. I'm okay. Because I realized the grief was mine, not his. He was okay. He was okay. And one of the gifts that autism has brought me has been the ability to put this into words. And because I can put it into words, in writing and out loud like this, I got the opportunity to travel around the country and to some extent around the world. And recently I came back from a, a trip to Asia and the Middle East, and I can tell you, and every time I go it's like this, and every time I might go to California or Nevada or you know, Wyoming or you know, wherever, Parents are asking the same questions I asked, and professionals are asking the same questions about how to understand the parents and how to help them. It goes like this. What caused this? Is there a cure? How severe is it? Will my child ever talk? Will my child ever be independent? Will my child ever have a relationship? Will... Will... How can I help my child? That's what it boils down to. How can we help? How can we make a difference? So, so that's where we're going to go now. How we can make a difference and find our common humanity. So, so in a recent book called Uniquely Human, Barry Prasant talks about how there's no such thing as autistic behavior, only human behavior. Now the important thing here is that this word autism often serves as a barrier between us and individuals who have this diagnosis. And that barrier can separate us from our common condition, our common cause, our common dreams and hopes. So, so let me take you through how we can break that barrier down. So, I've got several questions. So, anyone here, um, do you ever go to a sporting event, jump up and down and scream and cheer as your team hits a home run, scores a goal, wins the game? How many people ever like go and really are really enthusiastic fans at a sporting event. Raise your hands. Okay, good, thanks. How many here ever repeat yourself like to make sure you're being heard or to make sure people are getting your point? How many people here ever repeat yourself? Wow, that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're recognizing these things, right? So how many people here ever uh, don't like the labels on clothes, or the way fa certain fabrics feel, okay? How about certain smells? Certain smells like really skeeve you. You just can't stand it. And I understand during pregnancy this can be even worse. <laughs> even worse. But for people with autism, it's 24-7. Um, how many people here have some like really intense interest that sometimes distracts you? Okay, some people have two hands up. <laughs> Anybody uh, go on and on about your something special, and you don't? Then you realize people got turned off to your to your conversation. All right. Now, if you raised your hand for any of these, any of these at all, raise your hand now. Wow, look around the room. Just, just check it out. Are we all autistic? I don't think so. But, some people get the diagnosis because if you have enough of these symptoms, or traits, let's call them traits, and they occur frequently enough that they interfere with having a, a relatively functional life, then you need the diagnosis. You need the diagnosis in order to understand yourself, to understand your child, or your brother, or your sister, and to get the kind of help, and education, and treatment, and sometimes medication, that you need. 
to, to live as fully as possible. Now, while there's this great similarity, let's not underestimate the difference. Because this 1% to 2% of the population has a much steeper road to travel. So, how do we help? The most important thing I've found is that learning to make a difference is a huge step on the road to acceptance. So there's a series of questions or type of questions that I ask people um, that helps them find their way. So I ask, what's the best thing about your child? Or to teachers, what's the best thing about your students? Or to therapists, you know, your clients or patients, what's the best thing? What's, um, what's something your child did lately that was really cool? What does your child enjoy? And what do you enjoy doing with your child? And sometimes people don't know how to answer right away, but when they start thinking about it, they see that the road to acceptance and to growth is to find connection in the moment. Connection in the moment opens our minds and hearts. Connection in the moment is what we all need. It's what we all thrive on. Kids with autism can be harder to find connection with, and likewise teens and adults. But in those moments of connection, the barriers come down. The barriers come down. And we keep then moving along step by step. So loving this child and dedicated to this child or, or individual, we keep moving one step at a time. And sometimes, maybe, milestones aren't the best concept. It's more like inch stones. And we need to celebrate every little one of them. Because people with autism, just like everybody else, can live and learn through their whole lifetime. They need energetic parents and family. They need evidence-based services. They need a supportive community, and they need time. Time, a really important variable in this whole mix, right? And that celebration along the way, we all need that. We all need that. So we have really important things in common and important differences as well. So, as we go along, we're always figuring out what we can change and trying to get out of this trap of trying to fix everything. And boy, I've learned a lot about that. My wife and daughters have took me to school about that. They've helped me understand feminism and embrace it. The biggest thing I had to do was to shut up and listen respect their power, and get the hell out of their way. <laughs> now, that's not a swipe at men. We show our love by trying to fix things and make a difference. But if we learn to better listen, we can actually be better helpers. And the women in our life, lives will let us know what we can do to help if we listen closely. So, so these are the important lessons. And it's, I've been years in the making. And as I've traveled around the world and the country, people with different ethnicities, people of different color, people who pray differently, people who dress differently, people who speak different languages, we're all connected in a worldwide web of children and families, and yes, social media helps us, you know, kind of be there, you know, and see this more and more. And the thought I want to leave you with, very relevant to the world we live in and relevant to autism and beyond, is that what's really so important is to build bridges, 
not laws with the rest of the human spectrum. Thank you.